Welcome. This clinic is about digital photography for model railroaders. I'm Dave Freire, and my background is old-fashioned view camera photography. I learned the craft while I was in high school. After school, I worked for a professional photographer who specialized in men's shoes and Whitman sampler chocolates. The small Polaroid shot in the scene above shows me in 1966 at the NASA lab at MIT and they were growing solid rocket fuel there and I was filming the results. Later I was in Bob Hayden's cellar shooting his Carabasset and Dead River Railroad for Kalmbach and the candy box is the type of product shots we did over and over and over. What's the first thing you do when you get a copy of a model railroad magazine or you go to a new train website? If you're like me you skim the site or magazine looking at the photos. Good model photos can help you evaluate your own and other modelers skills. Photos can show your models to their best advantage. With an understanding of a few simple rules and with a little practice your photos can be as good or even better than those appearing in the magazines. I'm going to start with a few basic assumptions. First, your camera should have a manual setting. This is the mode we'll use most for model shots. And then read the manual. Whenever you have a question or problem, check the manual first. You'll not be able to absorb all of the info in the manual, and probably will not need much of it. But you should have an idea of what the camera can do. Along with the camera, you should own a tripod. You don't need to buy an expensive one. Buy one that you can fold up small and put in your luggage when you go on vacation. And last but not least, play with your camera. Know what all the knobs and buttons do. It seems that there are new digital cameras introduced every week. I can't and don't try to keep up. So I'm not going to talk about specifics, but about digital cameras in general. Today, even the smallest cameras take beautiful photos. This little Nikon has all the same features as the larger, more expensive Nikon cameras. The only difference is the image isn't quite as big. So we want to set our camera to aperture priority. We want to take pictures in the raw mode, if possible. And if you have a built-in bounce flash, it'll come in very handy for lighting the front of the models. I've used digital cameras for all my model railroad photography since 1999. My first one was a Nikon 950. I used it to take all but seven photos in my scenery book. So let's go back over this. You should try to buy a good camera, the best one you can afford. Use it in the manual aperture priority setting. Learn to use the fill flash. Use a tripod or a camera support wherever possible. Keep the lighting simple, try different angles, watch the background, and take lots of photos. That's how you learn what's good and what's bad. Today it's almost automatic to take good model railroad photos. Today's digital cameras come with wide angle lenses. They give you the best exposure every time, and exposure was always the big hang up years ago. The autofocus can be good and it can be bad, and we'll talk about that later. They give you good color rendition under most lighting situations. You get instant results so you can see how you're doing. And you can stick the camera almost anywhere and get a good shot. I bought my last digital camera because it came with a 17mm to 50mm zoom lens as standard equipment. The 17mm lens is a wide angle lens and I use it for all my model photos. I find the wider the lens the better. You'll get good depth of field and the viewing angle duplicates what you see with your eyes. There's only one problem using a wide angle lens and that is you can get distortion. So you don't want to get too close. Here's an extreme example of wide angle distortion. You notice how much bigger the front of the engine is as opposed to the rear of the engine. Let's talk a little about autofocus. Most of the time for snapshots autofocus is a good thing. Here in this picture the main elements of the picture are on the same plane so they're all in focus. Autofocus is really helpful for blind shooting where you stick a camera into an odd place and you can't really see the viewfinder. 
sometimes autofocus is not so good. In this picture, the camera focused on the central object in the scene, the crossing tower, making the foreground and background both out of focus. We'll talk about manual focus and where to focus in the scene later in this presentation. This shot shows the real advantage of a digital camera. Here the camera was on the tripod and was set in the auto mode. The self-timer was used to fire the shutter and all the lighting was from the display. The picture shows the display exactly as your eye would see it if you were standing in the room. On most home layouts and displays, you have mixed lighting, usually a mixture of fluorescent and tungsten lighting. On the left is George Selios's layout, where there's extreme mixed lighting, but the digital camera delivers a usable photo. On the right is a structure on an O-scale layout, and all the illumination in the picture was from the structure and a window in the far background. The camera looked at the scene and produced the best exposure. The small lightweight digital cameras can be placed almost anywhere. I've even taped the camera to a stick to get it into tight places. In this photo, the camera was placed on a track with a pencil under the lens for balance. I set it on auto and fired with the self timer. Buy a tripod that will fit in a carry on bag. A tripod will last you a lifetime, so buy the best one you can afford. Some of my best magazine photos were taken with inexpensive household lights. Here, a 60 watt bulb and a fluorescent ring provide the light for the following model photo. And here's the photo. It hasn't been photoshopped or manipulated yet. The background is a little pink because of the color of the paper the barge is sitting on, and this can all be fixed. Today's digital cameras don't require much lighting. Here's a Village Collector's waterfront display. These models are mostly in quarter inch scale. The overhead lighting is from a daylight type energy saving T8 fluorescent lamp. These lights are good for indoor layout photos. They're over my workbench and over the layout. These provide a soft, even light, and I can get good digital photos almost anywhere in the room. Here on Dick Rotto's HO Raton Pass layout, there are a lot of great scenes. All I had to do was point the camera and shoot. The camera was set on manual, the f-stop at f-22, and I focused on the f-e in Santa Fe on the side of the engine. The camera calculated the exposure and produced this image. The heart of a digital camera is the CCD, the Charged Capture Device. It was invented in 1969 at Bell Labs. CCDs consist of grids of pixels that are light sensitive. They react to light and color. These pixels respond to 70% of the light hitting them, making them far more efficient than film, which captures only about 2% of the incident light. What this means to us is that the more light we can put on a model or layout, the better the digital image will be. So now we know that the charge capture device works best when there's light in the scene. The more light, the better. And to help you out with more light, you can start with some inexpensive clamp-on photo floods, and they can fill the bill for extra light. Here's a bowl type work light sold in hardware stores, and you can put a regular 100 watt bulb in it. I paint the inside of the reflector bowl with flat white latex house paint. Two coats will usually cover. The white paint turns the inside of the bowl into a surface which produces a softer, more even light. The latest lighting technology is daylight fluorescent lamps. Photographers love them because they're cool no more hot lights, and these lights are great for both stills and video. Here's a home layout. Actually, it's the Pensy in Jimmy Sulla. Sometimes you don't notice it with your eye, but lots of layouts have real spotty lighting and dark spots. This is where one or two photo floods will come in handy to fill in the shadows and illuminate the front of the layout. Now, George's Franklin in South Manchester has mixed lighting. 
both fluorescent and tungsten spotlights. So I used photo floods to boost the overall light level. I lined the photo floods up along the edge of the layout and aimed them towards the rear. Many portrait and a lot of product photographers use what is called the classic three light setup. And the three light setup is this. One light, the main light, is above and to the left of the camera. It duplicates the light from the sun. The fill light, which lights the shadows, is on the right hand side at about the same level as the lens of the camera. It usually has a diffuser over it. The backlight, or the kicker, is usually behind and above the subject. The kicker can also be used to illuminate the background. So here's a close-up showing the terms I used for the lights. I want to go over them again. You can see the main light. This duplicates the sun and it's on the left hand side of the photo. The fill light, this bounces soft light into the shadows. This is low and on the right side of the camera with some kind of a diffuser to soften the light. And at the top and behind is the backlight or the kicker. This illuminates the top back edge of the model which separates it from the background. In my studio I used the three light setup for almost all the pictures I took and the lights were literally nailed to the floor. That way I could just put the camera on the tripod, put the product or the subject in place, focus the camera, adjust the exposure and take the picture. It was that automatic. Here's Joe Galdi's HO Rio Grande layout that I built with Bob Hayden. Joe had compact fluorescent lamps placed at two foot intervals over the layout. For this photo, I used the tilt-up flash on my camera as the fill light. The camera was set on manual, focus was on the end of the bridge, aperture priority at f22, and the timer fired the camera. For the best pictures every time, you need to turn off the direct flash on your camera if possible. In a model shot, nothing looks worse than the flat, bright lighting in the foreground and the dark background. I should mention one of the settings on your camera, and that's white balance. White balance tries to correct the effects of mixed lighting on your layout. It's a point of reference. You tell the camera what is white in the scene, and it calculates the correct values for the rest of the colors. On most layouts, under normal circumstances, the auto setting will work just fine. On George Selios' layout, shown in the picture, I used the camera in the auto mode. It worked and it made the colors look natural. When you look at the images your camera produces, you can tell if the white balance needs to be changed. The picture on the left is too red and the one on the right is too blue. The middle picture is perfect and it was taken using the auto setting. Even in auto, sometimes the white balance can be fooled. Here on George Selios' layout you can see that part of the image is pink and part of it's blue. It's because of the effects of spotlights and fluorescent lighting mixed. And there's not much you can do to correct this other than add more white light from the front. Here's another example on George's layout and you can see half the structure is pink and the other half is blue. And the only way to fix this is to add more white light from the front to cancel both the blue and the pink. Let's talk a little about depth of field. You may have noticed that most model photos have shallow depth of field or focus. That's because the camera has chosen the aperture and shutter speed and the only sharp spot in the picture is where the camera is focused. Everything else is out of focus. So to obtain depth of field, that's when your image is sharp from the front all the way to the back. You have to put your camera in the manual mode. And you'll also need to use a small f-stop and you set your camera to manual focus. So how do you increase the depth of field or the depth of focus? They both mean the same thing. As you can see in the example on the left here, at f2.8 we focused on the foreground and the background was out of focus. So to fix this we changed the f-stop to the smallest setting which is f22 and the image was sharp from front to rear. 
In this picture, the camera was set on F35 and focused on the guy with the bicycle. You can see that the only areas of focus are on a thin line parallel with the bicycle. Without moving the camera or focus, I changed the f-stop to f22 and took another picture. And what happens is that everything is sharp from the foreground to the painted background. The other good thing that happens at f22 is that the picture is a little sharper and has more contrast because I'm only using a very small portion of the center of the lens. Now here's where we get a little more technical. For digital tabletop photography, I always recommend manual focus. And to get the greatest depth of field, I recommend focusing at the hyperfocal distance. This means if you focus correctly, you'll get the greatest range of sharpness in your picture from front to back. So what is the hyperfocal distance? The hyperfocal distance is the closest distance at which a lens can be focused while keeping the objects at infinity, you mean the objects in the rear, acceptably sharp. When the lens is focused at this distance, all objects at distances from half the hypofocal distance out to infinity will be acceptably sharp. So to make hypofocal distance practical and understandable, you always focus about a third of the way into the scene, and it's the scene that you see through your viewfinder. Some of the best lighting for model railroad subjects is daylight. Here there's a long area from front to back, so focusing a third of the way into the scene is important. If you don't learn anything else here today, remember the words point of view. Even bad photos are saved with great composition. In this case, I just moved the camera closer to eliminate the distracting background. Here's a little exercise on where to place the camera. What I'm going to show you here are three points of view. The high view, which you see here, the low view of the same scene. This is almost a cliche, but it is a more dramatic angle. The bridge looks better when shot from below. And then there's what I call the scenery shot. In this shot, the train gets lost, but it's not the main feature in the picture. What we're trying to show here is the whole model railroad. Here's another layout shot for your consideration, and I ask which is better? This scene, which gives you an idea of what the barn looks like, or this low angle with its dramatic lighting. So you be the judge. Both pictures have merit, and they both tell a story. Let's talk a little about composition. You know, in eighth grade art class, you probably learned about the rule of thirds. This is a way of composing a scene so that the center of interest falls on one of the four line intersections. This rule of composition has been used by all the old painting masters. Here you can see in the Jean-Baptiste Simon Chardin still life examples of aligning objects within the rule of thirds. The top of the jug aligns with the top horizontal line and sits butted up against the vertical line. Even the top of the funny little pot on the far left sits on the bottom of the horizontal line. Your digital camera may have a viewfinder function called grid. It overlays the rule of thirds over your image. Here's another example. In this autumn scene, everything brings your eyes to the red barn. The overhanging trees, the road, and the shadows move your eyes towards the barn. These are called leading lines because they move your eyes to a spot or object that the photographer has selected. Here's another example. The kid with the red shirt is the center of interest, and your eyes go immediately to him when you first look at the scene. Here's another example. The nose of the engine is the center of action in this picture. Everything else is just a pointer that points your eye towards the front of the train. Here the engine was placed to give the best view of the bridge. The low angle also helps, but the nose of the engine falls squarely on the grid intersection. Here's an example of how not to use the rule of thirds. Your eye moves down the train to the caboose on the end. 
Then it hops over to the engine hidden in the background. It's very confusing to the eye. All the rules we've discussed so far apply to product and model shots. Good lighting is the key to showing off a product or a model effectively. There'll come a time when you'll want photos of the structure you just finished building, or you'll want a quick snapshot of the new tool you've discovered. These photos fall into the category of product photography. If you've noticed the types of product shots I like, you'll usually see a hand somewhere in the picture as a scale element. The model shots we've taken so far can be termed as tabletop photography. In tabletop photography, you control every aspect of the photo session. And because you'll be photographing stationary models, you'll have plenty of time to arrange and rearrange the models, the camera, and the lights to get the best possible photo. Now we're going to take all the things we've learned and seen so far and put them together. Here the camera was set on manual, aperture set to f22, and the focus was on the red box on the platform. The lighting was from a studio strobe, synced to fire when the shutter opened. And here's the resulting photo. This is an O-scale freight house that was offered many years ago by Scott Mason. Back in the 70s and early 80s, I wrote product reviews that appeared in Railroad Model Craftsman. I used an assortment of props to showcase the products. Here's the setup I used for many of them. The product was placed to show it off to its best advantage. Everything is arranged so you look at the product. The top view shows the setup and the bottom view shows the resulting photo. With your digital photos, it's always a good idea to have some type of photo manipulation software. The software will help you spruce up any images that need it. Many camera manufacturers provide software with the camera, or you can use something like Adobe's Photoshop, which is a standalone program. Here's a rather flat, uninteresting photo of the Franklin in South Manchester. I photoshopped it and got these results. The image has better color balance, it's sharper, and all the converging lines from the wide-angle lens have been straightened. Here's another tabletop photo. This is one where I created something from nothing. This is a setup on a board with a piece of track, some trees, some scenery elements, and the train, a very colorful train. Manual exposure, F-22, and I focused on the A in Arcadia on the side of the engine. Straight from the camera, this image is flat, it's washed out, and it has a heavy blue cast. After some minimal processing in Photoshop, the image has better color balance, is sharper, and some of the blue has been removed. In the days before Photoshop, I did a lot of what they call in-camera effects. In this shot, a sheet of glass was placed between the lens and the layout, and the smoke was airbrushed on the glass. The reason I included this shot is because there's still a great technique to use today with your digital camera. I wonder if anybody here today remembers the zone system popularized by Ansel Adams years ago. It was a way to get the most dynamic tonal range from any photo by exposing for the shadow area and developing for the highlights. Well, HDR photography is today's zone system. It's a way to use software to expand the dynamic range of a digital photo. HDR software incorporates multiple pictures made at different exposure levels and intelligently stitches them together to produce one picture that contains all the details in the both dark and the bright areas. And here's the resulting photo. This is a combination of five exposures. Many cameras have a setting to do this automatically. The first exposure the camera takes is two stops underexposed. The next exposure is one stop underexposed. The third photo is the correct exposure and then there's one that's one stop brighter 
and then the next one is two stops brighter. And what the software does, it stitches these all together. Here's an exterior shot that was five exposures. The HDR software assembled these photos and it allows you to manipulate them so that you can boost the color or the texture or increase the level of detail. Your phone is the game changer because your phone has become the best model camera you have. Forget all the stuff I just told you about photography. Whip out your phone, point and shoot. That's all there is to it. And here's the photo straight from the camera phone. It's good enough for most casual viewing and with a little manipulation in Photoshop it'll be good enough for publication. And now is the time for questions.